continuing the theme of Kiddush, so for a for my mom, Shifra Simcha Bat Yeta, and all Cholim of Klal Yisrael. Right. Okay, right. during Kiddush, it, some people have a custom to sit or stand, so it varies from household to household. So it says here, whether one stands or sits during Kiddush depends on the custom. In the, in the, in the evening Kiddush, some stand for the first two words, Yom HaShishi Velcho Shamam Vachula Shamaim, the first letters which spell Hashem's name. Some stand for the whole of the first paragraph since it, it testifies to the acceptance of the creation. And one is acting like a witness giving evidence. As you do, people stand when they're in the court, when they give evidence. Okay, Those who sit for the remainder of or for the whole Kiddush do so to designate their place for the meal. In accordance with the rule that Kiddush is located where the food is to be served. Another custom is to remain standing since the Shabbos is compared to a bride for whom one stands at a wedding. Okay, so I didn't know that. So people sit, so you actually have to stay there. That's your place where you're going to eat. <coughs> you guys know that? Uh, really? No, no, I've seen, I've, seen just, I've seen both customs. I've seen people standing and sitting. <coughs> I think generally, on, I think Friday night, quite a few people seem to stand and Saturday they seem to sit. But I don't know if that's, a, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. No, that's true. And the reason being is on Friday night, it says you need to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. So we known as ADEM, we have to give testimony to creation and therefore an aid stands, a witness stands. Uh, oh, that's a good answer. Both of you. I have. All right. Rabbi Kainet uh, answered Gavin's question. In summary, Gavin's question was, why would a creditor be motivated to lend the poor money when the poor could uh, destroy the encumbered field that is in his possession that he owes to the creditor? Or he could burn the, uh, the, the lien document, which means the creditor can't collect. Answer to those two questions is as follows. With regards to physical property, if the person that owed money, if the debtor decided to destroy his own property in order to be vindictive against the creditor to whom he owes money. Uh, it, firstly, it would be very unusual. And the reason it would be unusual is that generally people have a certain amount of gratitude if somebody pulls them out of hot water. You do have deranged people that have no gratitude no matter what you do for them. And this is the question, is what happens if you have those sort of people? So the reality is, is that they owe a certain money to this individual. Now, it's not like a uh, chapter 11 that you de can declare in America or in South Africa where you have insolvencies where um, you can tell everybody to get knotted and they can sue, uh, can sue your company, but your company has gone into liquidation. It doesn't work like that, uh, especially in those times, especially with personal debt. So if a debtor owed 2 million rand to a creditor and his house was worth 2 million rand, because generally he would only get the amount of loan to the degree that the fixed asset was worth. It's very unlikely that the person was given huge amounts of money based on movable assets because it could be sold under the creditor's nose because it's not a tangible fixed piece of land. So therefore any substantial amount would have to be equate to what you would use um, in terms of um, uh, collateral of fixed property. Otherwise, a, a creditor would be absolutely stupid to lend it based on movable property. If it's a small amount and you're helping the poor, that's one thing. But if it's a substantial amount, it would have to be based on um, a real physical item that could be used in lieu of payment. Since that is the case, then why would, if Rabbi Khan said they still owe the money according to the court, Arthur, can you throw your pets out of the window? Please. In a kosher way. I don't care. They've got nine lives. One can be lost. <laughs> Thank you, mate. I really appreciate it. So, what we're saying here is as follows, is that Gavin, they owe two million rand and they can't do anything in their lives until they pay it. They can't go on holidays, they can't buy things, they can't do anything. So if the property 
that they have is linked to the debt. They're only too happy to pay it off. It doesn't pay them to damage that particular piece of property because uh, they only owe the money anyway. It, it bears no benefit to them. I tell you when it can happen, David. Um, firstly, if it's the only property, then that's, that's another issue because it means the guy loses his collateral. And if he knows that you're going to, that you've got a chance of destroying that property, it is an issue. And I'll tell you why it's another issue is if that guy goes completely bankrupt and he, there's no ways he can pay that guy, he could be evicted and just destroy that property. No, he can't. And I'll tell you, let me answer your second question first. And I need you to hear me. Is that um, we're not, you can't have a collateral on rented property. You can only have collateral on purchase property. So if you decided to sell it to a buyer, the buyer had to check that there was no lien on that property. Otherwise, we learned in the duff before that you can collect it from a buyer because it's a buyer onus on the buyer to check that there's no encumbered lien on that property. And the first person that's paid is the creditor. If the buyer fails to uh, get a guarantee, um, uh, in writing that there's no lien, the default position is uh, that it goes back to the creditor, not the buyer. The buyer should have checked out if there was any incumbent lien on the property. It's his owners to check. So the creditor will always get that property. It doesn't matter if he sold it. He sold something that he no, can't. I didn't say it. sold. I'm saying he can destroy that property. No, no, no. Uh, but what I'm saying is the reason you can't, but let's address that second issue first is your second point was valid that perhaps he could sell it. He can't, uh, he would never be granted a loan based on rental property. So if it was his, he could sell it. So then he would get money and maybe run away from town or whatever the case may be. That's possible and start again. Then the creditor could collect it from the new buyer. Okay. As far as destroying his own property, Rabbi Cohen said there's no point because he owes that debt. He doesn't serve himself by destroying it. He doesn't earn more money he still owes the debt. This is the only way he can pay the debt back. There's no benefit to him to destroy his own property because he still owes the debt. No, no, but the evicted people don't care. I'm but just saying, but, but you're right. He can't be evicted from property he owns. Not evicted, vindictive. Vindictive, but it, 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 doesn't vindictive. Serve, yeah, vindictive. It, doesn't, it doesn't serve him to be vindictive because the base then still will hold him responsible either in Babylonia or Eretz Israel for the debt. He cannot move on with his life. He can never build a business. He can never own anything. He can never get married. He can never function in society. Uh, they'll put him in Khairim. He can oh, I understand that. There but why do they even allow him to, to damage the property? I don't understand why it actually allows him. Because they can't physically, it's, the issue is addressed because they cannot physically stop him from destroying property. You can't restrain a person from, you might have a mad individual that does such a thing, but it's very rare because it doesn't benefit yes, him. It gives him no fun. And how are you going to restrain somebody from destroying their own property? If yeah, you're destroying my property, you have to get access to my property. You can destroy the property that you are on currently because you have access to that property. Therefore, the situation can arise. And if it, it can arise, it has to be addressed. So Rabbi Cohen said the reality is the guy can do it and there's nothing you can do, but it doesn't serve him because A, he owes the debt and his life cannot proceed in any way. He can't get credit from anybody. It would go around town. There would be an injunction against him amongst the based him all over, no matter which one he goes to. He'd owe, uh, nothing is of benefit. Here he borrowed money and he's got some way to pay it back. And then that pressure is off him. To destroy that, he only damages himself. Yes, by damaging himself, he can also damage um, the creditor. But it's like being in a boat and you hate the other person and you both drown in order to uh, make yeah, sure yeah, the other person... So, yes, you can do that. If you're insane, you can do that. But you have to... But it's unlikely. I agree. It's very unlikely. Fine. Then the second point, which is a more serious problem, is what happens if you burn the contract altogether because now you don't have any evidence. That's a much more serious claim. Because the person that has a, a star always has proof that you are, so the debt will never leave the debtor, ever. But if there's no evidence, 
there's, uh, there, there's no proof that you owe money. That's the most uh, likely um, opportunity that the debtor has to uh, uh, clear the debt. Does that make sense? So I said to yeah, you, yeah, but what? Why doesn't a copy go? I know they couldn't make copies in those days. Why didn't they sign two DM so that the creditor had one? So if the guy did uh, uh, destroy it, uh, the owner of the property who owed the money, uh, the other guy could still get it because he's got a copy. I asked Trevor Cohn that. He said there was no such thing as a deeds office at that time. It's only in secular law. He said, no, no, I understand that. But why doesn't the creditor hold the lien, a copy of that lien, you know, even if they made it out twice and signed it? Uh, so then in case the blank, can you give me a chance, please, Gavin? I'm trying to give over what uh, Rabbi Khan said afterwards. You can ask anything with pleasure. Please just give me a chance. Okay. So what Rabbi Khan said is that the procedure worked as follows is that you had Kevin a contract, okay? But the, the contract was only signed by witnesses, a star, a contract. I said to Rabbi Khan, it doesn't make sense because today's contracts are written by both parties. Even in a business transaction, it's a buyer and a seller, or you could have a debtor and a creditor, or a purchaser, whatever. <laughs> You've got both those parties, okay? And then you've got the witnesses that add to the document. Rabbi Khan said that that wasn't done at those times. The contract, the star, was mainly a written testimony by the witnesses. It was only written, it wasn't signed by either party. I said to Rabbi Khan, that doesn't make 100% sense to me why the two parties never came to some written arrangement between them and you could only rely on witnesses. The reason being is if I have two witnesses and they come up and write something, I could have a vested interest by giving them money on the side in order to come up with any sort of document and say they witnessed this event. So that was the problem that I had with it. And your witnesses could die. People, you know, see, one is, of the witnesses could that, that is a valid point that the witnesses, uh, could die or they could leave town. And that's why you had a signed contract. But I said to Rabbi Cohen, if you had uh, both parties signing that contract in addition to the witnesses, it holds water because both those parties had to have agreed that, that all the witnesses signed their particular signature on the agreement. He said to me at that particular time, the witnesses only had in writing that in fact they signed that particular uh, document. In other words, it was a written testimony of their verbal um, um, testimony. That's what it was. It was a written notification of their verbal testimony. So the problem, as Gavin said, is one of the witnesses could die or disappear. And the other problem is that I could turn around and say that, ah, oh, Jesus. Barbara, I'm busy teaching. I'll phone you back. Okay. Sure. Um, so uh, I couldn't answer my computer's got WhatsApp now on it. It takes calls. Um, so what what the issue is is that I said that if uh, the other party came with two witnesses and they produced the star, and neither I as the other party, I could say they weren't the two witnesses. I disagree that they even witnessed the event. And the other party can say, sure, they were the two witnesses, and they could be um, conspiring witnesses. So I don't quite understand where Rabbi Khan was coming from with that. That doesn't make a hundred percent sense. Yeah, and also, if let's say those witnesses signed maybe ten documents in their lives, they might have forgotten what was what. You know, no, 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 no. That's why you have written testimony of witnesses. Meaning, it was if they if two years after they called to trial. They might not remember with clarity. That's why they wrote what they witnessed on those documents. My issue with uh, Rabbi Cohen okay, is got it, got it. why didn't the two parties write down what the agreement is and the witnesses uh, signed to the fact that both, the, uh, both of those made a public declaration uh, in front of those witnesses what had transpired and they could check that the contract was same. Had exactly the same they, information. They should have signed two, 
two copies because they couldn't copy. They should have signed two Correct. copies. So there should have been two copies in addition. Uh, in fact, there should be three copies. There should be a copy for the uh, buyer and the seller or the creditor and the debtor, a copy to them each, and a copy to the deeds office or a third party attorney that has a copy of the transaction of the witnesses. So that is what you call uh, foul proof in case one of the witnesses dies, they, they, et cetera, et cetera. So I agree with you. I don't quite understand Rabbi Cohen's point as far as that's concerned that it suffices just to have the witnesses sign uh, the, uh, their written testimony of what they witnessed. It doesn't make 100% sense. And that's why, Gavin, I wanted you to give me a chance to explain to you Rabbi Cohen's point of view in my conversation, because if you don't give me a chance, then I can't agree with you, even, because I'm trying to get out. So just be a little bit patient with me, please. Uh, Kev, are you feeling okay? Yeah. Shame. No, you were closing your eyes. Now, I don't know where Arthur's. No, I put my glasses on. I was rushing. I'm a bit tired, but I'm fine. I'm following. Arthur, we're going to address the new duff. Are you there? All right, while Arthur isn't here, I want to ask both of you a question, which hopefully Arthur will listen to. Is Rabbi Khan, I want him to speak to us in about two weeks' time, when we finish the first book. We're nearly there, guys. Hopefully we don't kill each other in the interim. Um, uh, what, I, what, what I was saying, and that's the satanic word, Gavin, um, by the way, just so you know, the fact that towards okay. the end of the so the satan at work that he doesn't want us to finish the first book. That's why we're getting on each other's nerves. Um, 100%. So, uh, and it's working. So. Amen. Better yeah. the devil you know than you don't know. Yes, very good. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, off. Are you with me, mate? You on speakerphone? <laughs> I need to ask you a question. Uh, I need the opinion of all three of you. Rabbi Khan once uh, has agreed to speak to us when we finish the first book. And I said to him, I want us, I said, this is the question I'm thinking of, but I'll put it to the class. What he told us last time is there's a difference between the manifestation of spiritual concepts that are taught in the Gomorrah with hypothetical cases and the practical application of how you roll out the law. Many times in a Duff, all of you have asked, well, how that, will, how that would work in real terms. I told him the example yesterday that I spoke about with regards to a car that was meant to appreciate to 800 zoos, but only appreciated to 400 zoos. When one of you asked, how do we measure such a thing? Maybe it's hypothetical, the ox would never reach that level. So I said to Rabbi Khan, I used the example of a calf because certain breeds of calves or horses or cows, et cetera, at three months, they would know at nine months the exact size that that animal should be barring disease following normal feeding patterns etc or even taking diseases and climate into account it was an exact science like uh, um, you know when you were dealing with animal husbandry it's pretty much like you were dealing with an agrarian uh, um, an agrarian society where they did farming it's a science so therefore that stage where there's a maximum amount of growth is from babyhood to adulthood. Once you reach adulthood, the growth is incrementally small. So he totally agreed with me that that was the perfect example to use in that case. Hashem gave me that idea. It's not something I thought about. But the th thing of it is we often have to think of practical examples about how to apply the spiritual principles in practical cases. Why I wanted Rabbi Khan to speak to us is there's certain leverage laws and mechanisms that we can use in the Gomorrah if we understand. So, for example, the courts had a system where if people were trying to get used to abuse the law, that this uh, Sanhedrin or the based in had control over certain overriding features. Well, how do you take uh, spiritual concepts and apply it in day-to-day -day living when you came before a court system in comparing it to secular law? One of the things is I'd like you to bring up to Rabbi Khan this very point, that the fact of it is it's a much more solid sort of uh, safety mechanism when both the parties, debt, debtor and creditor or seller and buyer, signed a document, had the witnesses sign a document, gave verbal testimony in case witnesses died, 
or witness were conspiring because if none of the parties signed the document and two witnesses came and I came before the court between uh, against somebody that I felt owed me something and I said this witnesses witnessed us together he'd say nonsense those witnesses are lying witnesses and they're going to get a share of the money you're going to collect from me so those sort of things I find problematic and I think these are the issues we need to address with Rabbi Cohen I want you guys to articulate this because I don't want it to be my questions answered and yours not I want you to each articulate some of the problems you have in your questions and us to formulate one or two questions to give to Rabbi Khan so he can prepare. Okay. okay, am I making sense with this particular discussion today? Mm. Is yeah. that secular law is not more advanced than Talmudic law, it's not. But obviously we're missing certain things, but I do think secular law has got some of, it might have more safety features because you're dealing with liars and derelicts. Whereas maybe in, in from times, people would take a oath and would be scared to use Hashem's name. So therefore they'd be more honest. But now you're dealing with people that you'd have to have so, low, so many countermeasures to make sure there wasn't fraud. But therefore, how did you deal with somebody in those days where there was fraud? So for example, Gavin, if you burnt a document, that's known as goma, indirect damage, and you could get away with it as a debtor. So Rabbi Cohen's response to me was, you need to hide the document better. But I could say, I could, I know it's funny, Art, but it's not funny because I could pick up two henchmen, right? Say, say Gavin owes me uh, money. Uh, I owe Gavin money. And Gavin's physically bigger than me. All I need is two guys that I pay. Say I owe 200,000 rand. And I pay two big briacus. Uh, You're going to need four. You're going to need four for me. I'm just letting you know. Okay, so I buy, I pay each one, I buy, I pay each one from the township who's living in squalor, 5,000 Rand each uh, to turn you upside down. So that's 20,000 Rand, but I owe 200,000 Rand. All I need is five people, four people from Soweto to threaten to rape and kill you and hold you down for you to give me that original document. Uh, that's and all my other documents. And, and all my other documents lying around. And all your documents. But the point of it, <laughs> we could make it look like a robbery. We could we could just threaten to maim or kill or rape you. And the point of it is, if there's only one copy, there's nothing you could do, even if you locked it under lock and key. We just have to wait for you when you get home. It bothers me, these questions. It really bothers me. Am I not, am I not, am I the only one that's bothered? No, no, I'm also bothered. Well, you can see I'm I bothered. never thought of but, that, but okay, I like your ideas. Hola. I've got a feeling. Yeah. I've got a feeling that the Beth then became the deeds office at some point. Yeah, but I'm saying, guys, you need you know, to articulate some... these mm -hmm. questions because it does bother me. Correct. We will. Bother see, because people draw things from their real life and then they they have you see, the questions. problem when you use an analogy like that is you're assuming send <laughs> four people from Soweto to threaten to maim, rape, and kill in order to get my document back. This is a theory answer. I moved to Israel. I'm safe now. <laughs> I'm harmless, guys. I wouldn't hurt a fly. Can no, no, I'm teasing you. No, not a fly, but other things, yes, not a fly. <laughs> um, yeah, so guys, I'm just saying this is a very relevant point. So you need to come up with this sort of yeah, to speak to Rabbi Khan. Let's get into the duff now. Uh, we've got a short amount of time and just discuss one or two uh, issues, okay? So the first thing of it is, I'm just giving you a summary. Uh, the first thing of it is the rabbis taught in the Brysa on 34A1, that if an oxide is worth 200 zoos, called another oxide is worth 200 zoos and inflicted an injury in it, it decreased its value by 50 zoos, and the value of the injured ox then appreciated and stood at 400 zoos. Uh, but if the other ox had not damaged its value, would have stood at 800 zoos. The damage it pays half according to the assessment of loss at the time of damage. What are we trying to say in a few minutes, guys? Is we're saying this is talking about the ox that's damaged. My ox attacked your ox. Your ox. Uh, is worth 200 zoos. My ox is worth 200 zoos. I damaged you by 50 zoos. 
In that case, my ox is Tom, it only owes you 25 zoos. Your ox is now appreciated, and I want to, it's appreciated from 200 zoos to 400 zoos. And I want to go before the court and say, why do I owe you? Your ox is doing fine. It appreciated to 400 zoos. But why do I owe you the money? Because your ox should have appreciated to 800 zoos. How do you prove this? Again, a vet can tell you that an ox at three months, a calf at three months is, is worth 200 zoos. At nine months for this breed with the right amount of food in these weather conditions would get to 800 zoos. It only got to 400 zoos. Since your ox has failed to appreciate, there's no ways that I can get out of paying you the 25 uh, zoos. And in fact, it's a kindness to me that the court, as a damager, did not make me pay that extra uh, 400 zoos for a lack of appreciation your ox has suffered. But I certainly can't get out of the 25 zoos I owe. Why can't, uh, according to Russia and Postport, I owe you for that extra 400 zoos? Because although it's accurately measured based on breed and uh, time span and correct feeding practices, um, the reason is, as Kevin said quite rightly yesterday, is that ox could have got hit by a truck. We don't know. So you can propose what should have happened to at least make the person culpable for what they owe, but certainly not to say that the calf has the potential of reaching this level and therefore you owe for what could be a future benefit. How do we know this? We take an example of a calf there. A teenage uh, uh, pot smoking, uh, no good beatnik that hardly goes to school gets hit by a bus and the person's negligent in their driving, they owe a coffee payment for some, for what the teenagers worth, not for a father of four and a husband that is a breadwinner and a successful chartered accountant. Who knows if this teenager would have become an accountant? Maybe he would have been in jail for grand larceny. We don't know. So we can't pay on potential. We only pay for what the teenagers worth. Okay. So that being said, we have to look at the cost at the time of damage, not the time of judgment because that's in fact when the incident transpired. Appreciation has nothing to do with it, where we take that as a benefiting factor. Guys, have I explained it in summary in a decent manner? I'm good. Good. Oh, that looks good. Kevin, you're right. You're okay, Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Ty, Ramon. Fine. So that's loss at the time of damage, even if the case is, uh, is afterwards. Why is the case later? Because we know what it, this is the time of the goring. This is the time of the trial. We know appreciation, what has transpired, 200 zoos to 400 zoos. What should have been 800 zoos? So we, we've got a timeline difference. So we can only judge it at the time of the incident, which is to the benefit of both the damaged and the damager. Um, so now we're saying, now let's take a different case. If we value the ox that damaged, now this is the attacking ox. This isn't the damaged ox. This is the ox that does the damage, the attacking ox, okay? And that ox appreciated after it damaged, meaning it went up in value. The damager pays the damaged party according to the value at the time of the damage. So what we are saying there is as follows. We're going to use the 200 zoos as an example again. My ox attacked Gavin's ox. And my ox was worth 200 zoos at the time of the goring. And now my ox has gotten fatter, now worth 400 zoos. And I have to pay on two leniencies, half the payment of the 50 zoos, which is 25 zoos, to the degree of the attacking animal. In other words, the body of the attacking animal is a second leniency. So in this case, it won't be any benefit to Gavin. Why? Because I only owe 25 zoos. These ox was only worth 20, 200 zoos, and my ox was only worth 200 zoos. But let's say the factors changed a bit, and my ox appreciating in value meant that if we do it at the time of the goring, I would have had a second leniency because my ox was tiny as a calf that managed to puncture Gavin Ox's heart and therefore did a lethal blow. But my ox was puny, it just aimed right. And therefore, in that particular case, I uh, owe less because the leniency is on the attacking ox's body as well as half payment damages. Then, at that case, if the damage is scored, but uh, my ox has now gotten fatter, and Gavin thinks as the damage party he's going to score. We say no. We work it out 
at the time of the goring, not afterwards, because Gavin would say in a different case, well, my ox appreciated double, therefore he's allowed that extra fat weight of the damaging animal to be to his benefit at the time of trial. Does that make sense? And the Gemara is saying, no, whatever happened at the goring happens at the goring. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. So what happened at that time, Gavin, is where it's calculated. Is it unfortunate for you? Well, it might be as the damaged party, but it's not unfair because you can only calculate it at the time of the goring. Why? Because the fact that my ox appreciated as the damager might be because I fed my ox and uh, I spent a lot of money getting my ox fattened up. Why should you benefit from that? Does that make sense? As the injured, well, I spent the money feeding my ox as the attacking ox. So you can't benefit from that appreciation. So even if my ox doubled in value, it doesn't mean that you can double your benefit on the body of the attacking animal because it's my money that fed my animal to get it bigger. So why should you partake in that benefit? So whose opinion is this? Uh, Rav Yishmael. But before we go into that, we're going to discuss that what happens if the attacking ox depreciates? Well, if the attacking ox depreciates, then you pay it at the time of standing before the court for judgment. So what does this mean? Well, this means very clearly that whose benefit is this too? Well, it's, uh, what do you say, guys? The damager. Um, so hang on a second. Let's just, let me just word it again. The attacking ox now depreciated in value. And then you work it out at the time of the trial, at the time of judgment. It's actually to the benefit of who and why. I need to know your reason. Okay, so I'll give you my reason. So it's the damager, and the reason why the damager gets that advantage is because he's, the body weight has gone down now. So because it's still time, so because the body weight's gone down, uh, you'll pay on the goof of the body half. What Gavin was saying is it is to the benefit of the damager because if the ox depreciated uh, from the goring to the time of the court, that depreciation, that's the new rate of what he pays in the body of the uh, attacking animal is to the benefit of the damager. And the reason it's according to Rabbi Akiva is that uh, it says that the transfer of ownership happened at the point of the goring. So now the damaged party should have looked after the ox better technically. So that's why, why should the damager have to pay? That's the theory. Does that make sense? Um, yeah. But according to the ox that appreciated after damage, the damager pays the damaged party according to the value at the time of the damage. That also is for the damager's benefit. Why? Because he fed the ox and he put attention. So why should the damager have to lose? So both these points are to the benefit of the damager. All right, guys, we waited all that time just to do a summary. Just one thing, the opinion of Rav Yishmael is about the ox appreciation. Why? Because the damaged party is considered the damager's creditor and merely as a claim against him for money. Does that make sense? So in other words, um, even though it was at the time of the goring, which we think automatically is Rabbi Akiva, Rav Yishmael said, you have to take into account the situation. Even though the judgment only takes place with the base den to sell the ox, you have to take all factors and all timelines into account. So it's merely a lien from a uh, credit uh, owed money by the, uh, uh, by the damager to the damaged party but we have to uh, do the judgment at the time of the court, but take into account at the time of the goring factors as well. So it is complex. Guys, I want to thank you for attending. I hope this year was decent. And thanks, Gavin, Very for giving me a chance to explain. Thanks,